Humanity has since the drop always assumed that there was something in the woods. We would sit around our fires, which lit only just the first few trees around us, warning one another about what lies just beyond the veil of darkness and the dangers that lurked within. In some ways, we were right. Bears, wolves, honey badgers all could tear you to shreds in a few seconds. But other tales are much more mystical in their warning. Creatures that were stronger than humans faster, and likely better hunters in general, that may not even really exist within our dimensional plane fully. These are creatures that would scare ancient man, but as time went on, we began to fear what was out there less and less. Into the far-flung future, past the point of stone axes and spears, having replaced those with counters of much more aggressive means that can throw lead and deal virtually with any issue at a distance, we have begun to fear kind of less what lies in the forest, as those stories are just relegated to legend. In modern times, there's no need to worry about things that go bump in the night because humanity has already conquered it. But how do you conquer and destroy something which seems that you can't really damage? Or for that matter, even if you do, if it just shows back up, all while dealing with other humans who you were sent to eliminate. And more to the point, what even are these things? If you answered a form of ethereal herpes, well, you would be right. No matter how many times you get rid of it, it just kind of keeps coming back. In the events of Bone Cold, a sniper team of two, the actual sniper and the spotter, are sent to the northwest frozen forest of Ukraine in order to prevent a leader from rising in the area and making it more unstable. And you'll never guess what country of origin he's from and how he's messing the stabilization of that area, but after landing there, the sniper would ultimately begin spotting something moving in the tree line, stalking them from afar but never quite making it to them. So the question becomes, what actually is this thing? Is it real or just a figment of human imagination? Let's discuss that in today's episode over the movie Bone Cold. Also, this is going to be more of a supernatural episode, so strap in. We kick off our story immediately because due to the false copyright strike from South Korea, this channel has no discoverability for like 32 more days, and uh, who knows, maybe you are someone who slipped through the cracks. So, we start off in the desert, the opposite of cold bones. A man walks along the road with a metal detector, hearing shots firing off in the distance. As he does, he finds a chain and finds a cache of sorts. Lock and loading, Brides of Christ, he doesn't last long before he takes a shot to the dome. Well, obviously we can't show that. Reaper team landed the shot, and now the target is neutralized, so it's time to go home. But already things seem kind of off. As the sniper stands up, he sees the man also standing and shimmering in the distance once more. Checking down his scope, nope, he's still on the ground, but I'm pretty sure that's a great time to alert your spotter that you saw something. It could literally be another person who just hit the deck after seeing you. Then again, I'm not a military sniper. So let's talk about this for a moment. By the way, if you're new, information now gets added into the actual summary. I don't make the rules, I just work here. So to set the stage for what this thing is, we need to talk about and take into account a few things, like where we are, what it can do, and what are its intentions for the human that it is currently stalking. You know, the whole know your enemy type of deal. Every culture, regardless of location on this rock, has stories of creatures that hunt humans. What I always find fascinating about this type of storytelling is they will each typically have multiple different creatures in general to their geographical location, but most will sport some sort of supernatural ability to hunt in almost an amplified way that humans hunt. Humans are known as persistent hunters, and I swear this is off topic, but I had this one guy in the comments when I said humans were predators. He stated that, well, because humans would be eaten if we didn't possess the intellect we had, which means we wouldn't be predators. Like, bro, if we're just randomly nerfing species to make them non-predators, let's remove the tiger claw and their teeth as well, or like a bear's ability to move. That would render them no longer predators because they could be eaten. It was the it was the most dumb thing I've heard in a while. Anyways, the point is, humans are predators, and not just that, but we're actually apex predators because of our intellect. It's one of our assets that we have that makes us better predators. When we picked up a stone and said, here, have rock, and threw it at a saber-toothed cat's head and rendered it unconscious, sorry about your hundreds of million years old evolutionary arms race other animals, but humans just ascended to cryptid status in that instance. Like, individually speaking, Yes, we could be taken out by bears or lions or tigers, but reality is every animal, if humans group up, which is what we like to do anyways, it is just so completely at our mercy that we have to make rules for ourselves not to go after another predator such as great white sharks after the movie Jaws came out because Homo sapiens in general is an absolutely wild species because of how we look, how we act, and we're hairless by the way, so we look diseased, how we walk on two legs, which no other animal does, and how we can think abstractly, which no other animal 
can even touch concerning our ability to just conceptualize the world around us. It's truly what makes our species special on this rock. I believe that is what scares us the most as well. Possessing these abilities, it's sort of like collectively we all look over our shoulder wondering where is the thing that would force us to obtain this otherworldly level of traits. How in nature could we be just so far beyond what other creatures are capable of and there's nothing that would put those traits to the actual test? Because of this, I believe this is why humans created cryptids. Creatures that would really use our strengths even better than we could ever hope to, and no matter what we threw against them, how far we ran, or how much we grouped up to combat it, it still wouldn't be enough. So keeping this in mind, there are a few things and a few types of these cryptids that will hunt humans and stalk them across deserts and into other areas as well. I have a particular creature in mind that this may be due to its hunting patterns and how it's able to maintain a connection to the duo, or at least John in particular, and how it could take the shape of a man. But before we get to that, we need more information. Heading home, the Chamber of Commerce lady sees the soldiers and comes over to thank them. And I personally never know if the military members think this is cringe or not, uh, but I always appreciate it because that means I don't have to do it. So, you know, thanks. As I sit there, John is lost in thought because he's tired of this grandpa, but as we will come to find out, that's too damn bad. Heading home, they pull up in this Tacoma, right? And for some reason, I have no idea why they did this. It sounds like a diesel truck, which is absolutely hilarious. I have a forerunner. They do not sound like that. Of course, uh, I've now said several sentences about it, and uh, you can't even hear it, so we're just going to move on. As John heads into the house, though, he's having flashbacks to the guy that he just 360 no-scoped, and he hears a banging noise which grabs his attention. That'll be important later, for apparently reasons. Like, the noise itself is important. What it actually has to do with the creature is beyond me. To be honest, I haven't yet gleaned any of what the banging noise is, or why it would be ever important, even in the future as I record this. But, you know, you'll be right where I'm at here in a minute. So, heading inside, he sees his offspring, which... Alright, so, family advice from Papa Roanoke. If you've been gone for like 10 days and your youngling is grounded, which in this case is a dumb reason, like she took a picture frame or something and brought it home, uh, just let the youngish adult break restriction to stay up with the other parent to watch a movie together. Sometimes in life, it's not about enforcing punishment. It's really about coming together as a cohesive family unit. This, no, even though your father has been gone for 10 days and was just in a dangerous war zone whose job is inherently fraught with life and death scenarios and really any job could be his last, so your time spent with him is really important. You can't watch a movie with him, uh, even though he just got home. Homework in bed. That's bad parenting. I have no idea why this annoyed me as much as it did, but let me climb off this really tall soapbox. So after Mom of the Year sends her offspring away, like, she's not an Amy, she's just making a bad choice. She tells John that, no, she stole a picture frame of her teacher's baby and put it next to her bed, and yeah, it's a little weird, don't get me wrong, but even still. So, she hits the hay as the youngest adult then asks if her dad's job is hard. Well, it likely is a little difficult as it's catching up with him mentally, it appears. So you're going to notice a theme here, actually. I know I, I keep breaking away, but I hate to be this guy. Ah, who am I kidding? I love being this guy. But this movie wants to have it both ways. It wants to like hint at it being like a psychological disorder such as PTSD, but that's the thing because there's literally a thing following him in the real world that has real world consequences. It'll become more confusing later as the movie will refuse to elaborate the actual status of its reality, but you know, Papa Roanoke is here to bring you context clues that show what it actually is even though the movie won't. Okay, so this part actually made me laugh. As he heads out into the garage, he sees a painting that his wife did and she's like, oh, don't you recognize it? It's you. My my wife and I actually both laughed because I actually said this joke literal seconds before she said it, and I thought there was no way that she would actually make a painting of him catching what appears to be a shot to the dome. Like, bro, you know your husband's a sniper, right? This mom's just on a whole nother level. She has inklings of amyisms. So, John says, well, that kind of scares me, but I really don't want any of you to know what I do at work, so let's not talk about it. Bro, that painting is awful. Like, I thought it was gonna be one of those things that maybe it, like, pan backs, like, pan back around, and he was just hallucinating because in his head he was actually had PTSD, but no. She just straight up showed him getting domed abstractly. So the next morning, it's World War Z breakfast time with the whole family cooking breakfast as one does before the youngling goes to school, quite literally. So then the dad gets a call interrupting breakfast. I believe that also happens in World War Z. And Colonel Nathan is telling him that he needs to brief him on his next mission. John's a little upset at the 24 hour turn and burn, but hey, that's the job. Also, I have that gray shirt at home. So he hugs the family goodbye and then heads for the mystery fed building. Also top notch security in this place, badges like that couldn't be faked at all. So we meet up with Marco once more. They both feel like they're being fairly rushed. 
We now meet the Colonel, who I'm pretty sure those sleeves are rolled up incorrectly, but uh, who knows? Maybe work on some muscle mass there, bro. We also meet the Glowy in the back who needs to fix his tie. A tie should end just above your belt, like literally just above. This is too high. That inch of space? No. I will complain more about that later. During their brief, they are showed what they're going after, what their odds are, and who they need to get and what the cabin looks like. Essentially, they are headed to a state to do some camping, like always. No, it's not a legitimate strategy. Come out so I can use my LMG on you, you coward. So things are starting off pretty slow, right? Uh, you don't know the half of it, because you really only know the third of it, because technically speaking, in this movie, we are only 15 minutes into it. I only bring you the most speedy of movies. I know, I've, I'm just on a hot streak lately. But the creature... Uh, is interesting, depending on who you ask. Another team was sent in prior, but came back. The colonel says that there was a lot of confusion on the ground, and that they were sent in for a full psych evaluation as a result and can't be spoken to. Yes, it's not sus at all. With the urging of the colonel to just disregard any information they need, and what appears to be prior planning, the duo does agree, so they just kind of leave. And the fed boy looks at the colonel and says, Oh, uh, if anything happens to them, that's on you. And the colonel's like, Ah, they'll be fine. That's some sweet, sweet copium right there. So now it's off to the wonderful northwestern Ukraine woods on the border of Russia. Not a hot zone at all. But at least now we are officially in the woods where the movie's supposed to be taking place. So something's actually probably going to start happening at this point. As they stop for a moment, John talks about how his wife probably wants him to leave the service as he keeps looking into the woods. He doesn't like how he's following the footsteps of a failed operation and will quite literally not stop talking about it. Bro, just assume you're better than everyone else. Like, it's a great way to get your mind off potentially your inevitable doom. Just assume it won't happen. They set up the area and then leave a shirt so they can identify where they should be extracted from. As John keeps walking, though, he sets up to scope out the area. Literally, he sees something, like, right there behind the tree. Spooked, he sends Marco to flank around the corner, and as he gets over there... Marco approaches it but sees absolutely nothing. This begins instilling in Marco a sense of doubt that John really does have it all together. Also, John literally rechambers that round like five or six times. Like, if you go and watch this movie, he keeps doing that. After you do it the first time, it should be good to go, man. Don't worry about it. But after finding nothing, they keep moving to their primary objective. Approaching a state from the hill, wait, I already used that joke, they then set up and begin to watch the area for movement, confirming that there is someone inside. As a man sits down, they can't see who he actually is so they cannot take the shot. Marco leaves John a little while longer as John then hears a shriek from behind him but ignores it for the most part. But he does take a look behind him and sees that there was nothing there so he turns his attention back towards the main target. Time passes as time tends to do as he finally wakes up and heads outside. They call out the personal identification as John takes the shot and then ends him. I guess you could say not a way to get ahead in life. Oh brother this guy stinks! <laughs> Well, he'll never be the head of a major militia force. It's time to stop! Really not time to lose one's... Okay. Excellent. Uh, now that my retention rate has dropped down to 7% for stealing that joke, with the mission accomplished, they head back to the extraction point. And as they do, however, the drone operator known as Angel 6, it's her stage name as she's in Las Vegas, tells them that they are waiting for further orders. They apparently took out the wrong person. Oopsie doopsies, we made a big fucky wucky. So, they are forced to wait there due to bad intel. Marco tells them to just chill out because John is, like, seriously taking it personally. They sit outside all night because what else are you supposed to do as then they wait for orders. John asks if there are any hostiles in the area of the previous target site as Angel 6 comes back and says that there's nobody out there. John wants to go back and check it out to see if there are, like, any signs of enemy movement or activity because he's feeling sort of bad about doming a random civilian and it would make him feel a lot better if there was at least something tied to the militia. I probably would as well, so I can't really blame the guy. They then check for a wallet on Mystery Man, but find nothing. Then heading inside, they really find no signs of anything, that he's related or connected to anything. And eventually, though, they do find his wallet and confirm, whoops, that is not the guy we were supposed to take out, and there is nothing suspicious about this place. So, not only is it bad intelligence, but it's suspiciously bad intelligence. As John argues with Marco, three hostiles begin moving into the house, but as John goes to leave with Marco, he hears a shriek, the banging of a door. Again, I break off to tell you why this is confusing, right? These creatures that John is seeing, or are seeing, they're in the real world. They exist because, as we will come to find out later, they can absolutely be seen by others. Yet, when John is seeing the doors move or hearing shrieking, nobody else can. I really don't understand how this is possible. So, this clarifies a point I made earlier. This movie tries to have it both ways, but it's very clear that they are leaning towards it being like a PTSD disorder of some sort with flashbacks and how John is beginning to hear things that aren't there, which is why Marco cannot hear the shrieks and 
playing on the fact that, you know, John won't tell anything to anybody about what he's experiencing, but clearly this thing is producing compressional waves in the air for John to hear, yet nobody else seems to be able to actually hear it. Now, there was a idea I had essentially that maybe it is messing with his brain it can somehow tap into that but no I kind of doubt that because of the way it operates others begin hearing it randomly too it just isn't possible so we'll come to find out this is really tough so first these things are supernatural but have physical bodies and second they exist at least momentarily on the same plane of existence as humans if John can hear it Marco should be able to hear it as well too oh yeah Again, I brought you one of these movies. I mean, how do you follow up a successful Jurassic Park episode? At least I assume it is. I'm writing this before it's released yet. And this is me, after it released. Did all right. So John heads to the back of the house to check out the banging door, which is banging for some reason. It's never explained. Am I to believe that one of these creatures is just sitting there opening and closing the door? Because without any information added at this point as to why it's happening or what's related to, it can only be just that. As John stands transfixed by the chicken coop door, opening and closing, this gives time for the hostile militia members to just show up. As they book it out of there, finally, John hears more shrieking noises, Yet, nobody else hears it. It's not possible. God! <laughs> One of the militia then leans down at the target, finding him. His name is actually Pavel, and they are angry because civilians are being taken out now. But this is an interesting statement, and I didn't pick this up on my first watch through. They are taking out civilians. Who are they? Could be Americans, but the militia doesn't actually know that Americans are there, and the original operation was canceled. They could be referring to the more localized forces that the militia was forming against, but as made mention by the colonel in the beginning, the issue hasn't really kicked off yet. It's just a brewing one. I believe what she is referring to are the actual creatures. As we will see here momentarily, they appear to respond to human aggression forcefully, but if you do not engage or enter combat with these creatures, they do appear to kind of leave you alone unless you are in an altered mental state that essentially brings down your resilience, I believe it would be, in dealing with these creatures. That's right, it's a breadcrumb story, but unfortunately it goes through the bread forest where the ground is also made out of breadcrumbs and the plot makes no sense. As they continue to run, John hears a shriek again and turns around, yet Marco hears nothing. Looking through the scope, he spots one, but for some reason, Marco cannot see it, nor can the drone overhead. Again, I want you to remember, these are physical creatures in a physical world. They have to be based on what I believe them to be is a physicality. However, there may be an explanation as to why this is, but I'll cover that momentarily. But just know that Marco sees nothing, so they keep hoofing it. Coming to a thin area of the forest, they find an American-issued knife that came from the original group. John hears a growl and sees a creature in the woods. Marco takes a look and again, cannot see anything. John starts freaking out as it's getting closer, and then sees it once more. He takes a shot, nailing it in the chest, as in the distance the militia heard that. John wants to confirm, but Marco still can't see anything on the ground. They get up and get out of there, but the hostiles are moving in. The shot fired did knock down the creature, but we will see later, this caused the creature to fixate on John as opposed to taking it out. They split up as a fight ensues. They are able to take out two of the guys, but in the process, the counter sniper in the militia then hits Marco, but his armor takes the shot. So now it becomes some nice sniper on sniper action. And also, fun fact, women make excellent snipers. Something about their hands being more steady due to less tremors and breathing activity. Like during World War II, they were stacking bodies. So John starts looking for the counter sniper but can't see anything. Marco puts his face around a tree for some god-awful reason to draw the sniper out and gets lucky he doesn't lose his head but his face does get injured by shrapnel. But it's alright, chicks dig scars. He gets some cracked ribs from earlier and he's really not doing so hot. John tells the drone pilot that there's a sniper in another hostile, but Marco tells him that's not true, it's just a sniper. John relents at this point, so their only option is to pop smoke and have Marco run. Alternatively, he could have put his hat around like a corner on a stick, and that maybe could have drawn fire. Like, man, why are you risking your brain case? So popping smoke, he then runs but trips, but before the sniper could take the shot, John then hits her with his own shot. So Marco now has his jimmies rustled by John for putting them in jeopardy. John says, I'm not crazy, which is usually what a completely sane and rational person says. No need to look any further into that. Marco calls it in that they drop the sniper and it's time to get them home, but they now have a new set of orders that come in. They still have to go after the original guy as they were sent to go get him in the first place. John tries to talk to them about what they've seen out there, but Marco stops him because he doesn't want to be removed from field work. 
Now, the thing I know about Marco at this point is this dude would be struggling. A lot of people have this idea that when you take a round to the chest wearing armor, that you're totally fine. The bullet didn't hit your meat. Well, prepare to learn some fun facts about that. Energy, while dissipated slightly, continues on. The round will stop, but the force will continue. Much like my conversation about the Quiet Place monsters and how a 50 cal round would still create a liquefied tissue on the other side of that armor caused by the round's energy transfer, the same would happen to Marco, except there was less energy in that round. The shot would ultimately crack a few of his ribs located directly behind the shot, which would be incredibly painful. Every breath would feel like you were cracking them further as they were forced to move. Now, it did not appear that the pleural cavity surrounding the lungs would have been pierced by his ribs, because they were only cracked so you wouldn't have to worry about anything like a pneumothorax or a hemothorax the difference is being when air leaks into the lung cavity collapsing them versus when blood leaks into the lung space collapsing them but his rib cage would be compromised should any more damage be incurred or just the right hit happened hopefully that doesn't happen later that night as john takes first watch he scans the area with marco sleeping a few trees away as he looks around he sees something shimmer and then spots one of the creatures another one then walks by him and approaches Marco. And we finally see this thing like for real. It can camouflage, but can definitely absorb some lead as well. We only get a quick view of it, but there are a few other scenes to display it much more clearly, which we will get to, and this kind of helps to explain why many others may not be able to see the creature despite John seeing it directly in front of him. So it grabs Marco and begins dragging him away, and this is where we see something pretty funny. So uh, John pops a glow stick, right? Well, the light coming from this glow stick apparently is underneath his arms, and the top part where the glow light should be hitting is just completely completely dark. I don't know, I, I thought it was funny. As John moves through with this strangely placed light, he can hear Marco yelling at the creatures and shrieking. Marco then pops a light but manages to survive the attack by stabbing the creature. This means the creature can be injured and will retreat if injured. The only thing that does that is something that can be taken out by traditional means, which indicates to me what I think this is holds even more relevance. These things also appear that they're really much more powerful than a man. Also, Marco's ribs went from cracked to broken during that attack, and from here, they begin hoofing it away from the area, considering they are camouflaging monsters around them, and they survive in the next morning. So, the question is, also, why can some see them and others can't? I believe it is based on position. They will reveal themselves directly to a person that they actually want to see them, right? So it's sort of like looking at a rainbow. If two people look at a rainbow, even if it's in the same area, it's actually, you're seeing different water droplets scattering the light. So it's actually not in the same area, even if you're standing right next to each other. I believe that's how their active camouflage works. I think it's more of a biological active camouflage as opposed to a technological, just by the way that there doesn't really seem to be a suit on them. But what I believe is happening is, even if you're standing next to somebody, the way that their body diffuses the light, it'll look completely camouflaged to you, but it's directly on at somebody who's looking at it. So if Marco stood directly in front of John, he might be able to see it, like face to face, eye to eye, where he's like looking, he might be able to see it. But if he's even off to the side a little bit, it camouflages its side and that way you can't see it even if you're just maybe a couple feet away. So let's move on, shall we? John and Marco then share a story about how the things they find funny they probably shouldn't think are funny, such as a mechanic's uh, arm exploding and it landing in another sergeant's arm and they thought it was hilarious. Yeah, you know, life does that at some points pretty bad. So at this point, John puts in a final request for exfiltration, which gets denied. They're running really low on ammo, but decide to just keep moving. Yeah, they're quite literally going to hoof it out of there. But eventually, they do just kind of run into a compound where their original target is supposed to be. As they look out, they see the targets as a group then heads out to take shots. And like, you know, firing shots, not good shots. So they figure out where they should go. Actually, you know what though? Firing shots are good shots. But eventually, they figure out where they need to go to get the best vantage point, and they just start setting up. The trainee line up and also the duo are given orders that no identification is necessary. The group then lines up and begins firing at targets as John takes a shot and takes out all three and then hits the commander as a firefight ensues. So this happens for a while, lots of filler shot, blah blah blah, but eventually they emerge victorious as John sees it was a non-lethal hit on the commander. John asks for identifying information, he won't take the shot, so Marco goes up and does it for him. As Marco goes to call in the kill, he then gets shot and takes a round to the throat. Sniper Lady has returned. So Marco is donezo, but before he goes out, he spots one of the creatures. He gives it the finger as it literally tears off his head. See, PTSD can't do that. It's a real thing. That must have hurt. So prior to the ripping and tearing, 
We get a good look at its hand, which is interesting for a few reasons. This species is clearly something of its own. The index finger is much longer, with almost a staircase pattern on the hand. The skin is dark and black and smooth. This will be similar to the rest of the body in some respects, but we'll see it more clearly here in a moment. What we also know about these creatures is they appear to know what ends humans and may take trophies, and they camouflage. They take trophies and camouflage, and they're stronger than humans, and they hunt in the wood. This is starting to sound really familiar. So this spooks John as he freaks out and runs. He has a nice scream in the forest at the woods before spotting it. It begins mimicking his breathing pattern as Sniper Lady sees John having his freak out and then spots the creature. Getting a good look at it, it stands about the average height of a man, in fact it's bipedal as well, and looks to use this form of stance as a standard functioning. The skin on it's kind of wavy and blackened, however, with this particular one, it appears to have been hunting John because he injured it. If you look at its chest, you can see its ribs are somewhat exposed, and there is an obvious injury to it, and it's made known by its glowing orange color, which we can assume to be the underlying tissue in the body. Interestingly, this does give a hint as to its physiological functions. Having orange blood would be an indicator that it may be iron-based blood, potentially leading to more of like a red blood, sort of like with humans and what we would have, but there also probably is another protein present, such as high concentrations of vanbin, which contains the element vanadium. This may not transport oxygen, but the presence of this iron hemoglobin like it would have mixed with this yellow protein that is found in sea life, for instance, would cause this tissue and blood to be more of an orange hue and means that it could breathe our atmosphere. This would allow for it to continue to breathe like humans, obviously, which clearly it's doing this as it mocks John before they confront one another. Its ability to sport an injury like this and keep moving also shows it is much more resilient than a human and what we're able to withstand that would take us out. Because during the attack, you also see its brain is exposed on the side of its head, uh, which wouldn't be something that normally we would survive. Not to mention the ability of it to rip off a human head with one hand, as it's previously done, or another head done in the group, would indicate it is stronger than Homo sapiens as well. But... I do want to bring it back to the sniper lady and what she said earlier about it attacking civilians. These creatures seem to only attack if you attack them, otherwise they would just kind of observe you. This has indicated that really, it just appeared to be observing John until he put a round in his chest and it became personal. The skin of these creatures appears to be able to actively camouflage, but again, I don't believe it to be technological, I believe it to be natural, but based on lore, this also is kind of one of those things that these creatures, that I think it is, have been said that they can phase out of our dimension in general. Again, we will discuss that of what this thing is when we get a better look at its face that only a mother could love. So she watches, but decides not to take the shot on John as there's no sport in that. John then takes off his armor like an idiot and approaches the creature as it activates its cheats and goes invisible. Again, personally, I think humanity could take most creatures in a fight if they weren't lame and stopped using active camouflage. The Yaucha, the Sangheili, these things can all catch the hands of Homo sapiens, but they have to be little wimpy frady cats. It's literally the Chad Sight by Light versus the Virgin Light Diffuser is all I'm saying. So the sniper lady then pans over and again spots the creature and decides that she doesn't want to mess with that. But what's more interesting is she doesn't really seem phased by that thing existing. This is why I believe that they were concerned about what she had mentioned with it attacking civilians. The creatures, again, do not appear to go after those who cause it no harm, but instead will go after those who they deem as aggressors, which is interesting because the Yaucha did. If you don't have a way to defend yourself, the Yaucha would just kind of leave you alone. But if you do, uh, it will absolutely go after you. But, I mean, it does make sense because uh, it sort of really does make you wonder, as far as why she didn't seem phased, is what was the militia actually forming to fight? Because clearly by her response, they were dealing with these things already, and the local population may have been attempting to unite against them before the good old U.S. of A stepped in. Team America, baby. So because John took off his armor like an idiot against this creature that he doesn't even know what it can do, actively trying to take him out, the creature takes full advantage of this and essentially just disembowels him on the spot. Getting an excellent look at its face, we see teeth that are several inches in length that come to a sharp point, indicating that these creatures are, in fact, carnivorous. Along with their claws that can pierce the human abdomen with ease, they have forward-facing eyes, or at least the ocular cavities where jet black eyes sit because you cannot actually see their eyes. There is no hair on their heads and instead it is smooth except for a little bit of brain that's exposed. The expression seems to be one of more curiosity than anything and they really don't appear to see humans as a threat. So, like, John should actually be completely gone, right? End of movie. Well, it's not. I, I literally opened up, like, I thought this was the end. I was like, wow, that sucks. It ends there. There was 25 minutes move of movie left. It blew my mind. 
So here's where things start getting super confusing as to what these things actually are. As it reaches up into his thoracic cavity, my wife thinks it became him, like a physical manifestation of guilt. I thought it was a form of alien cancer. Turns out we're probably both wrong with the original thinking, because this is future Roanoke, and after doing several hours of research, I have a way better idea. So John gets back up and is totally fine now, somehow. And it makes it seem like he's possessed. This will never be addressed. Literally, it is the strangest thing I've ever seen in a movie. So John heads home and gets promised medals as Fed Extraordinaire with his tie too high above his belt in the background stands there. Fix your tie, bro. So John then asks about what happened to the last team and finally he gets told some information. The last team just straight up didn't like their odds so they came back, a luxury not afforded to John and Marco. As he leaves, the alphabet boy then turns, Colonel, whatever happens, it's on you. So again, John is looking a little stiff, right? Like he's possessed. So later on, he stands in the shower burning his skin in hot water and says, I'm still cold, bone cold. During dinner, he sits there lost in thought while his daughter tells a story about something. I don't know, I wasn't listening. But if her own father isn't, then why should I be expected to? So uh, after he gets done sitting there, they go to bed for the night as he has visions of the creature in Ukraine. As he heads in the living room, he has flashbacks to what he did at dinner and slamming his spouse against the wall, all classics. Did it happen or was it a hallucination? Uh, who knows? So then his daughter catches uh, one to the dome after she comes out of the... What is happening? Apparently his wife was already domed too. I have no idea at this point if this is real or do I? Because he wakes up from his nightmare and then takes out the TV. If it was on any news channel nowadays, that's probably the best thing you could do for it. His wife then scolds him saying, bruh, you can't just open fire in the house. Also, John is just bleeding out of random orifices. Don't look into that. At this point, he heads back to Fed Central to confront the Colonel. So let me save you a whole ton of nonsense. Basically, John and Marco were sent in to take out the original guy, but had to end his civilian brother in order to draw him out. They would make it look like a fog of war sort of accident and then pin it on John and Marco. Everyone gets what they want. No responsibility to the people in charge. Yay! So John comes out sweaty, which I thought at first it was like maybe John took the Colonel out and then the Fed was going to walk back there and then he'd take the Fed out, but apparently not. He just sort of says, I'm done, and leaves. Okay. I, they couldn't afford a fight scene, I guess. But at this point, John is ready to talk to his wife and tell her what happened. As he tells her, though, he begins hearing the mysterious banging noise outside, which is never what you want to hear. He goes to check, and now the absolute freakout begins. I like how his wife says, oh, the wind must have picked up, but if you look back there, the plants outside aren't even moving. So John starts screaming at the window like a chihuahua as he grabs his force multiplier and tells his wife to get the youngling to get out of here. He stays at the window like an ultra chad and sends his wife and offspring outside into a potentially creature-infested yard. But then he spots Mr. Breathy out back. Also, again, in the window reflection, it's the creature, and it's him. But then it moves out of the way. How is it still in control of them? It, this movie makes my brain hurt. So the wife then tells the offspring to stay in the car, and if she's not back in five minutes, to just run over to the neighbor's house, despite all the monsters outside. She runs back inside and finds John sitting on the bed with a Glock in his sock. She then hears a shriek from outside so she can hear it, and panning back to John, uh, bro, I don't think I can show this on YouTube. I'll describe it. Metal to skull. Don't blame me. I just work here. So as Mel tries to get him to, like, just chill out, the creatures have begun their attack. So you're ready for some more confusion. Okay, these things are real and have real consequences. But she's like, oh, they can't hurt me. How do you know that? How, how are you not seeing these things? And don't hit me with the, oh, they're in your head because she heard it shrieking a minute ago. And they literally tore off another dude's head and sniper lady saw it. Like, what is happening? So one comes up behind Mel as then John turns and it flashes over to the youngling. All right, so here's something else I found really funny. This is a high gloss Prius, right? If you look at the car door, you can see the camera tripod. And when the door opens, you can see the light diffuser used to brighten up the area. It's literally all right there. It made me laugh. So the youngling goes inside and finds John and Mel have conquered his literal demons that can rip off human heads. Okay, then. So, like, I was totally expecting this to be an orphan scenario. So now John stays up at night watching and waiting for the demons to return. And he still has a literal scar on his stomach indicating that this was a real injury he sustained. And it would have real impacts on his body because his intestines fell out. Where's your colostomy bag? And then it all ends. It's just a, a fade out shot of a guy at a window. I have no idea what that's about. So I think I've hinted enough at this point, talking about all the context clues that we have. This creature that hunts humans and leads them into the woods by appearing and wanting them to follow. He met this creature initially in the desert and it appears to phase in and out of our dimensional plane of existence. So what is it? 
It's a freaking djinn. What's a djinn, I hear you asking? Well, wonder no more. The djinn is a pretty gnarly set of creature. In fact, in Islam, the djinn are essentially, or it's pronounced two ways. I'm American, so I say djinn, but it can also be called a djinn. Essentially, these creatures were made not as beautifully as humanity. However, they are similar in several ways, depending on which subset of djinn they are. Jinn can be animalistic creatures, like crawling or walking on all fours, swimming, but they do not dwell within our dimension, and some Jinn can be somewhat human in appearance, but worst of all, they can be notoriously hard to kill. Some Jinn will actually lead married men away from their wives and have children with them. This is very likely uh, the Muslim culture trying to explain why men would leave their wives, but others would just kind of lead travelers off of a road into the desert and then consume them. These things are pretty much bad news, but they can essentially always see humans through dimensional rifts that they make, but humans cannot see them, which is why, again, Marco couldn't see them, but John could. And this would be why it appears like camouflage out of existence so easily, because it's actually exiting our dimensional plane. So how do you actually take these things out? Well, there's actually a lot of lore on how to do it, but one main way that you can actually do it is to stab it. And that's why it may have actually reacted so violently to Marco stabbing it, which made it pretty upset so it came back for him, and why it actually saw John as a threat with his knife. There are stories of men actually killing these things with force enhancers, also known as spears, but with a force multiplier, it does not appear to be able to put them down. Ultimately to me, it looks like John had stumbled upon a djinn, and it was probably part of a larger group potentially harassing this side of the planet, which considering where those tales actually come from concerning their lore it would not be really too surprising because that is the geographical location where they're supposed to be located. Jin typically stock isolated areas for humans and given their mission parameters, it was able to attach to him. The other thing to know about the Jin is they also possess the ability to possess humans should they not really want to consume the person, which appears to be exactly what it did to John. Despite him seemingly beating the possession though and surviving the encounter, because again, Jin can definitely be taken out, I think what he would fail to realize is the rest of the Jin group still know where he's at and they still have him in their sights, who uh, they now have his family in view as well. Although seemingly, as long as they don't attack them, they won't attack him. It appears they only go after the one who injured an individual such as themselves. So John would have to injure another one for the process to start again, but because he is now talking with his wife, his mental resilience may recover making possession more difficult and if this thing showed up to his door and wanted to have babies with them he would probably say no i would hope because they look really hideous so this is a bit more of a supernatural episode but regardless i hope you enjoyed it if you did then leaving a like would be fantastic as it does help during this just wonderful copyright time of year and subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on when i post also i will stop complaining about copyright once this freaking thing expires which again 32 days we're almost there, guys. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and channel links in the description, such as Roanoke Tales, where I talked about the Summerton Man last week. And speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you to our astrophysicist, Death Dancer. Thank you, sir. I'd also like to thank our scientists, Chad W., Lacune, Logan Satome, and Tyson Nakanishi. Thank you, guys. And the rest of my patrons, I appreciate your support as well. It's always amazing to me that people want to support the channel, so thank you. Well, uh, I think that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed. Don't get lured out into the wilderness by uh, a creepy thing and have children with it. And I'll see y'all in the next one.